The elusive worlds of American spy agencies like the CIA and the Defense Intelligence Agency have always been associated with secret and unimaginable missions that reach far beyond our everyday reality. At the height of the Cold War, the United States government learned of Soviet psychic research. Fearing potential security threats, the U.S. Army created their own psychic secret agents who used a clairvoyant technique called remote viewing. Classified logs note that sometimes they could sense a target 2,000 miles away. These are some of the claims recorded in the government's logs. When Brigadier General James Dozier had been taken hostage by terrorists in Italy, Chief Warrant Officer Joseph McMonagle sensed his whereabouts. Long before a high-tech warplane became public, Master Sergeant Melvin Riley drew a picture of the stealth B-2 bomber. And hours before the destruction of the USS Stark in foreign waters, Captain Paul Smith perceived a tragic loss of life at sea. There is no scientific explanation for these unusual results. How ordinary men and women remote view is and may remain unexplained. In 1976, Dale Graff worked as a civilian aeronautical engineer at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. The Air Force asked him to do research on remote viewing to see if it could be applied to missing aircraft, pilots, or hostages. Graff went to the Stanford Research Institute, a think tank in Northern California, which had completed hundreds of controlled remote viewing sessions in their laboratory for the CIA. Graff decided to challenge the think tank to a psychic game of hide and seek. Stanford would pick the remote viewer and Graff would select his secret location. What I did, I created a list of 10 possible targets in the Dayton area. So I decided to choose one, a very unique site that if the individual working in the project that day, Hella Hammond, who was in New York, if she could identify anything resembling that, I would feel very comfortable. Graff settled upon the Ohio Caverns, a historic site unknown to outsiders. He says he told no one about the location. Not Hal Putoff, Stanford's director, and certainly not the remote viewer, Hella Hammett. All Graff told her was that he could be anywhere in the USA. It was a cave. Uh, a commercial cave about 30 miles north of Dayton. And there's no way she could have second-guessed that. We went through the cave tour, uh, following a guide. We were with a lot of people down in that cave, 200 feet below the surface, misty, dark cave, and then came out about 45 minutes later. Eager for her results, Graf telephoned Hella. Her first words were, I don't know where you people were, but I think you were in a misty, dark, cave-like series of passages. A psychic phenomenon or coincidence. Graf, impressed but still skeptical, decided to do another experiment. He flew off to Canada for a three-week, 400-mile canoe trip down the Coppermine River. He made arrangements with Harold Sherman, a Midwestern psychic not associated with Stanford, to keep a notarized journal of his trip. Could Sherman have certain psychic impressions of events that occurred to Graf while he canoed the rapids? Graf claims that Sherman was able to remotely view parts of his whitewater adventure. One of them occurred at a time when I got very sick, about halfway through the trip. And uh, I was sick from either black fly bite reactions or, or something I ate, and I had a terrible nightmare uh, one night, thinking I was even dying. And at the same time, about one hour separated from that time, Harold Sherman woke, woke from a nightmare. Also, thinking that something terrible had happened to me. The following is an excerpt from Sherman's journal. My conscious mind does not want to let me accept a tragedy, but I feel a mental distress call, and I feel helpless to do anything about it. 
The next day, the Whitewater Adventures went through a series of dangerous rapids. Sherman noted once again in his journal, I record this scene with great reluctance, that this actual happening could be the end of the canoe project, as all seems to have been caught in the vicious rapids. Canoes dashed end over end, and bodies flung about in the turbulent waters with little chance to escape against canyon walls. After reading Sherman's journal, Graf concluded that there was something to the phenomenon. After I came back, after recording the information in my journals, having movie records, and Harold's data was notarized, and then an individual unconnected with us made an evaluation of the results. And it turned out that there were some good correlations at the time, and Harold had certain impressions written that occurred to me. While Graf thought remote viewing was worthwhile, so did the Soviets, who were also funding paranormal research. Coincidentally, the Army found out about the Soviet research, and they asked counterintelligence officer Lieutenant Frederick Atwater to find out what the Russians were doing. I went back to my command. I said, yes, there is a threat. The Soviet KGB and GRU are, in fact, spending money on remote viewing. We're paying attention to the satellites. We're locking our documents up at night. We're running security background checks on our personnel. But how can we protect ourselves against this thing called remote viewing? Atwater concluded that the Soviets' clairvoyant spies posed a threat to U.S. security. In response, Major General Edmund Thompson the Army's Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence gave the final go-ahead to set up an American psychic spy unit. So particularly with the Russian background uh, and involvement, I tasked a small think tank I had to take a look at the problem. And they soon determined that the uh, most fruitful area uh, to explore was the use of remote viewing for intelligence collection and for counterintelligence. With Atwater at the helm, the ultra-secret spy unit slowly materialized. He went to the Stanford Research Institute in Northern California and examined psychological profiles on people there who were successful at remote viewing. Within a matter of weeks, Atwater returned to his post at Fort Meade, armed and ready to recruit intelligence operatives for the Army's new psychic unit. Then we went to the people themselves. We were assessing whether or not they had a propensity, an artistic talent. Had they ever had a ESP or psychic experience before? Or did they reject it and saying, oh, that's totally wrong. That's totally false. I know everything there is to know already. And then the final thing was that they had to volunteer. These people volunteered to be part of this effort. In 1978, a secret high-tech Soviet plane went down in Zaire, and the United States wanted to find it before the Russians. After the CIA failed to locate the wreckage, the psychic spies were put to the test, including both Graf's Air Force Group and Atwater's Army remote viewers. The psychic spies were asked to study a photograph of a Russian Tu-22. Their written impressions and drawings were given to the CIA, and hours later, the missing plane was found, within a few miles of the perceived area indicated by one of Graf's Air Force remote viewers. Years later, the incident was confirmed by none other than former President Jimmy Carter. Not only did it happen, said Carter, but a woman psychic actually succeeded where the spy satellites had failed. Carter explained, I have to say that without my knowledge, the head of the CIA asked her to come in. She went into a trance, and while she was in the trance, she gave some latitude and longitude figures. We focused our satellite cameras on that point, and the plane was there. This incident launched a new career path for Graf. He left the Air Force, and in 1989, Graf became the director of the Psychic Spies at Fort Meade for the Department of Defense. Codenamed Stargate, Graf's unit was occasionally used to remote view by the U.S. Customs Service, the Coast Guard, the Drug Enforcement Administration, as well as various Pentagon offices. It was often an uphill battle 
to convince people of its worth. I can remember going through a number of presentations to very high-level people, including chief scientists and commanders, and they, they essentially uh, turned pale when we mentioned what it was we were trying to do. And I, I'll never forget one statement. Uh, I wouldn't believe this even if it were true from a chief scientist, for, uh, of all people. So instead of saying, we don't know, what you've got, let's take a look. In spite of some startling results from the military's remote viewers, mainstream scientists tend to reject remote viewing research, calling it pseudoscience, a morass of fraud and illusion. Can a human being see something miles away in a place they've never visited? For Dr. Joseph Rauschecker, the answer is no. Most of us in science would have the same natural reaction that probably most of your viewers would have, that uh, viewing somebody remotely who you've never seen before is not possible. Remote viewing is an, an ability that we all have, a latent ability that we all have to access information beyond our normal senses. It ties in somewhat to older terms like extrasensory perception uh, or telepathy as some people years ago would say. But it's, it's, it's basically an innate ability we have to reach beyond our ego uh, boundaries and sense information which is shielded from, from normal means. Major General Thompson was the Army's foremost proponent of remote viewing from 1977 to 1981. He witnessed the results of psychic spying missions firsthand. Over the years there have been sufficient uh, demonstrations of the existence of so-called extrasensory perception that uh, it exists. We can't explain it and uh, my interest was not in explaining it, I'll leave that to the scientists. My interest was to see if it could be used operationally uh, regardless of what, what the uh, science behind it was. The phenomena of remote viewing would be challenged by both science and the military for years to come. From the mid-1970s to the late 80s, the Pentagon spent millions of dollars on paranormal research in an effort to boost the nation's security. A couple of their clairvoyant recruits were intelligence officers who had served in Vietnam. Melvin Riley, drafted in 1969, wanted absolutely nothing to do with fighting a war. He got lucky. Instead of being a grunt on the battlefield, he landed a job in the intelligence community as a photo interpreter. I was 23 years old. I had no desire to go into the military. The thought of being out in a rice paddy in the infantry carrying an M16 and watching out for landmines and, and ambushes and things like that. Um, photo interpreters uh, were pretty much behind the lines. Riley's unit flew surveillance planes. He sometimes served as an aerial observer peering through binoculars and telling colleagues where they should point their intelligence gathering equipment. At other times, he was studying photos from satellites and spy planes. It was very attractive to me, the challenge of finding hidden things, uh, because a lot of times the enemy would camouflage things and you would have to really look hard to uh, pick those things out. From the beginning, Riley had good intuition. He seemed to know instinctively where to fly the plane, and where to point the camera. His talents were respected. After the war in early 1978, Riley was ordered to an eavesdropping proof room, where he and other candidates were briefed on the remote viewing program. I had never heard of remote viewing. And being sanctioned to do this? How wonderful. Why not? And it, it was... And, and I wanted to know, hey, is there anything really to this? Riley's psychic abilities were immediately put to the test. Several military officers were asked to hide in a nearby guest house on the Fort Meade campus. Riley attempted to find them. He sat in a dimly lit room and described his impressions. I saw a manhole cover. I described that in the ground. I described certain architectural uh, aspects of the building itself. And one thing I described, I think, was a bicycle or, or some sort of vehicle. 
The novice psychic spy identified some of the elements of the target, but not very accurately. Military analysts considered Riley's first session a promising start, since nothing in intelligence gathering is 100% correct. That's why in the intelligence business you use multiple sources to cross-verify each other. And remote viewing became just another one of these multiple sources to cross-verify other information. An investigative aid rather than the ultimate tool. In 1979, when other forms of intelligence gathering failed to figure out what kind of nuclear device the Chinese had just developed, the military brought in several of the psychic spies. What is the design of the nuclear device, they asked. Were the Chinese going to test it? Some of the descriptions that I came up with uh, got the attention of uh, the community that deals with nuclear devices uh, because there, were something, there was something that we sketched or drew from remote viewing that would tend to indicate that the Chinese were more sophisticated than uh, the community had thought. Riley says he and the other remote viewers were rarely told the results of their sessions. They were never told what the actual target was prior to, during, or after the mission. However, information had its way of trickling down to the psychics. Within days of the remote viewing sessions regarding the nuclear device, Riley discovered that the Chinese attempted to test one. It misfired. Once you successfully accomplish remote viewing, and it's not 100% all the time, but once you have a couple of really good sessions, it kind of changes your outlook on the universe. So much so that Riley would sometimes complete a remote viewing session and find himself oblivious to his own actions, as he discovered one day after a particularly intense session. As I was walking from one building to the other building, for some reason, I took my car keys out of my pocket, walked over to the garbage dumpster, dropped my car keys in there, and walked over to the other building, not knowing what I had done. The people who were walking out behind me were, were certainly laughing. And uh, I said, what's the matter? They said, do you know what you just did? I said, no. And they said, you, you just threw your, you know, your keys in the garbage. And I said, oh my god. In order to clear his mind, Riley did Indian beadwork, his way of overcoming the dreamy after effect of remote viewing, a job that depended solely on his extraordinary senses. All our job was to, was to report our impressions, uh, our, what we could see visually in our mind's eye, uh, the sensations we had, uh, sights, sounds, feelings, textures, tastes. Uh, we would just produce raw data. Intelligence analysts would take Riley's psychic work and review it in order to determine if any of the information was useful. At times, Riley would become frustrated because he wanted to know more about his mission and the government refused to tell him. Then there were the rare times when Riley discovered his senses were a direct hit. Our unit was given the task of supposedly looking at some new Soviet type aircraft. I was really confused by this thing that had a big fuselage kind of shape, like a Boeing 747, but it didn't have any tail. Riley's intricately written impressions and sharply drawn sketches were given to the Air Force. The drawings were immediately confiscated and Riley was told to stop remote viewing the target. Unbeknownst to Riley, he had remote viewed his way into the heart of the stealth B-2 bomber program, the Pentagon's most secret weapon. I had no idea that the, the stealth aircraft ever existed, the fighter or the bomber. Everything I did within the intelligence field was classified. And much of it was classified much more highly than the remote viewing. Melvin Riley spent seven out of his 21 years in the military as a psychic spy. Were his occasional hits the result of coincidence? Did he actually give the military reliable information? Uh, I could, couldn't pass a good scientific judgment on uh, 
the phenomena. Uh, what I did know was that whatever state it was in, that uh, it did not provide to me the type of uh, intelligence that I could utilize to accomplish my mission. We must have uh, been accomplishing something, if nothing else, in the research area uh, that was positive, or we would not, we would have ceased to exist. And not only that, uh, it seemed like every time the program was dumped by a organization or a unit or the army, etc., somehow it was picked up by another agency. It was kind of, I jokingly called it the Phoenix uh, Project because it always seemed to be rising out of the ashes again. Edwin May former director of the Stanford Research Institute agrees that remote viewing worked and had been demonstrated repeatedly by military personnel. He says he bases his conclusion not on belief, but rather in years of research and experiments. I became more and more convinced of its reality, not based on a single gee whiz example, which had been all over the, the, the media, but rather careful analysis careful looking at whether or not we were fooling ourselves, looking for alternative explanations. And when all the, that search for alternative explanations of how this might work failed, it says we have an anomaly here. As the remote viewing unit evolved, it adopted scientific testing procedures to identify promising psychics. Secrecy always surrounded the paranormal program and made recruitment difficult. Some say this was to keep the unit from Soviet eyes. Others felt the psychic unit was kept a secret in order to protect its supporters from embarrassment. Captain Paul Smith was not afraid of controversy. When he heard about the paranormal unit in 1983, then known as Stargate, he eagerly introduced himself to its commanders. And they discovered that I had an interest in art and languages and music and all that kind of stuff, and they were those aren't normal combinations for an army officer to have. And they said, hmm, you know, we may have a deal for you. <laughs> Smith listened attentively as the army briefly discussed the needs of the unit. Then he agreed to a series of medical and psychological evaluations. I apparently scored within the, the frame that they wanted people to score in and um, invited me over to the office, sat me down and said, well, our mission is to collect intelligence using parapsychology skills. I don't remember exactly how they phrased it. You know, essentially be psychics. And I thought for about two seconds and said, okay, where do I sign? <laughs> Smith had no formal training in remote viewing. His commander simply escorted him into a darkened room, gave him a pen and some paper, and asked him to perceive the location of a couple of his colleagues. And so as things came to mind, we didn't know if they were our imagination or if they were real perceptions. You might all of a sudden have the impression of something squeaking and going up and down, and it resolves itself into something swinging back and forth. According to his commanders, Smith's first session was amiss. He did not correctly locate his colleagues at a playground. Disappointed, Smith became doubtful about his remote viewing abilities and his future as a psychic spy. Our missions weren't just uh, there to collect information against the enemy, we're also there to assess what kind of information uh, the other side could get from us using these same techniques. People have this image of the cloak and dagger stuff and most of the intelligence done in the military is not like that. It's more down to earth, where are the enemy tanks right now kind of thing. On Thursday, May 15th, 1987, the unit's command ordered Smith into the remote viewing room and gave him the longitude and latitude numbers of a location. This time, Smith hit the target. Smith perceived the presence of a U.S. naval ship, a missile, an explosion, confusion, and a tragic loss of life. The intelligence community dismissed the data as unreliable, not because it came from a psychic, but because a terrorist attack on a United States naval ship was not considered feasible. 48 hours later, thousands of miles away in the Persian Gulf, an Iraqi warplane fired a French-made Exocet missile and hit a U.S. Navy warship, the USS Stark. 
37 members of the crew were killed. An example of paranormal precognition, or simply a good guess. This was, after all, a time of significant anxiety in the military over the Iran-Iraq War and its threat to U.S. naval vessels. Neuroscientist Dr. Joseph Rauschecker was asked to evaluate whether this could be a paranormal event. I mean, the, the cases that you described sound really pretty unbelievable to me, and, and, and you know, in, in, without making any judgment, I'm just unbelievable and surprising. And the only explanation, as, as I mentioned before, I could come up with is that people had some prior knowledge, were experts in that field, and maybe were able to come up with an informed guess. Um, scientists generally don't like to believe in stuff, but as you become more and more convinced about its reality, it's, a, it's like a little puzzle. You just keep adding to it. There's not a single day where you say, aha, now I believe. That, that never happens in science. It's this lack of concrete information that disturbs scientists and leaves them asking for more. It's always a bad experiment where you just have a phenomenon and no explanation. And in this case, we can't come up with any conceivable explanation from the knowledge that we have in neuroscience right now. And therefore, you know, most of us are hard put to, to deal with this. From my experience, while I worked at this unit from 1977 to 1987, I saw literally hundreds of remote viewing exercises and dozens of extremely valuable pieces of information provided to the intelligence community. During my period of time, during my tenure there, it was an extremely valuable collection tool. Paul Smith joined the Army's psychic squad, leery of the remote viewing phenomenon. After years of exposure and personal clairvoyant experiences, he came to the conclusion that remote viewing is possible. I went from being, you know, totally dubious that, that the thing even worked to being absolutely convinced uh, through many years of exposure and evidence that it works. And uh, that flies in the face of what's currently believed, particularly in the scientific community, about this stuff. Many people believe they have psychic talents. But what emotional and intellectual mix makes a government remote viewing superstar. Born and raised in a rough Miami neighborhood, Joe McMonagle joined the Army in 1964. He wanted to be in artillery, but instead ended up in intelligence, deployed in Vietnam, south of the city of Da Nang. Like many young men heading to the front lines in Vietnam, McMonagle had reoccurring nightmares of dying there. What would happen in the dream is I would die in a blinding flash of light. So when I got to Vietnam, I started telling people that I knew that I know I'm going to die. It's going to be an artillery round or something that's going to kill me, maybe a mortar round. To his amazement, no mortar or bullet round ever found him. McMonagle made it out of Vietnam on his own two feet. In 1977, while working for Army Intelligence in Austria, his nightmare became a reality when he collapsed and went into convulsions. I had a sense of falling backwards into a tunnel, and at the bottom of the tunnel, I felt as though I had bumped up against something. And I turned around to see what it was, and when I did, I was enveloped by a white light and realized that I was in the presence of an unconditional loving being and uh, I was told that I could not die yet. I had to come back. It was exactly as I had experienced it all those years in the dream. McMonaco miraculously recovered and spoke openly about his near-death experience. Army physicians concerned about his health and his out-of-body claims tested him to see if he had any brain damage. The tests were negative. I think I'm just a normal person. I, I think one of the hidden secrets is that uh, almost every human being that walks the face of the planet experiences some form of psychic, they just don't talk about it because there seems to be this, this sort of giggle factor that's brought up whenever they do. And so people have been uh, trained, at least in this country, not to discuss those things. 
McMonico returned to the United States and worked for the Army's Intelligence and Security Command at Fort Meade. He was in charge of a group of technicians and worked as a radio interceptor when he met Skip Atwater, creator of the Department of Defense's Psychic Unit. Suddenly, McMonico's career took a new direction. And it may be that something in my records keyed it off. It might have been the near-death experience or something. Or it might have had to do with the kind of selection criteria that they were looking at. Atwater shipped McMonagle off to the Stanford Research Institute to test his psychic ability. The test required that selected Stanford employees go to six different locations in the San Francisco Bay Area, while McMonagle sat locked up in a secured room. And, uh, at a specific time, They'd show me the person's picture and say, describe where this person's standing. And so I would sketch the location and talk about where the person would be. Stanford analysts noted that McMonagle identified where five of the six people were. A phenomenal result. The young warrant officer turned out to be a natural clairvoyant. McMonagle's psychic abilities opened up a new era in military espionage. In October of 1977, McMonagle returned to the Psychic's headquarters at Fort Meade, Maryland. The Pentagon's ultra-secret spy unit worked in a windowless, soundproof room. Most sessions lasted less than an hour. Normally, there were only two people in the room, the clairvoyant and a monitor, the person who would guide the Psychic through the session. The unit's first big mission was the Iran hostage crisis. The Army psychics were called in. 350 photos were literally thrown on the table, and the spies were asked to select the hostages. And over a course of about a day and a half, the group of remote viewers were able to positively identify 64 people. And uh, we were also able to identify three or four people that weren't held with the rest of the hostages. During McMonagle's 17-year psychic career, identifying hostages was just one of his secret missions. He was never told how the psychic's information was used. That information is still classified. Among McMonagle's other disclosures, he also claims to have penetrated a secret Soviet building and detected a high-tech submarine, the Typhoon, the largest submersible ship in the world. And he takes credit for visualizing where kidnapped Brigadier General Dozier was being held by the Red Brigade terrorists in Verona, Italy. As exciting and ultimately gratifying as these missions may appear, McMonagle says the work was overwhelming. Exposure to the dark side of civilization took its toll. And you soon find yourself on the outside of civilization looking in and it's it's very difficult to recapture the normalcy that uh, most civilians enjoy to some people in the intelligence community the clairvoyants were a national asset to others like the former director of the defense intelligence agency lieutenant general ed soister their work was completely unreliable he tried but was unsuccessful at terminating the psychic unit I was a responsible officer and uh, decided that the phenomena did not merit the same support as other intelligence disciplines, which were on a continuous basis uh, giving us good information. During the Cold War, the United States government resorted to every means of collecting information, such as spy satellites, radio interception, and covert operatives who disappeared into the world's back alleys. Like a giant jigsaw puzzle, each piece of information helped to complete the picture. If you ask me, did remote viewing contribute to that process? Very clearly, yes. If you ask me, was it ever used exclusively? No, it was never used exclusively. Nor is any piece of intelligence, at least wisely, ever used exclusively. It would be very astonishing if, if remote viewing was in the realm of scientific possibilities. It would be very surprising to me if this came out of any scientific investigation. For those who participated in remote viewing, the successful missions are proof enough.
We don't know all the answers to remote viewing. I'm not sure we will in the next 10 years. However, there's not a shadow of a doubt in anybody's mind that site functioning is real and that it operates. And I think that it's absolutely essential not to let other countries find out how that works before we do. After nearly 20 years of study, neither the government nor any of the psychic spy unit staff can say what enabled remote viewers to sit in a darkened room and see subjects thousands of miles away. What is known is that from its inception in 1977 to its end in 1995, at a total cost of $20 million, psychic spies conducted thousands of remote viewing sessions. Paul Smith, now a retired Army psychic spy, agreed to participate in a remote viewing session for the unexplained, loosely based on the methods of the Stanford Research Institute. Smith's session began after a Texas resident, Janice Hamill, photographed five locations and concealed them in separate envelopes. A different number was put on each envelope. One envelope was randomly selected and given back to her. Hamill left the area. Then, without the remote viewer or any participant of the session nearby, Hamill opened the envelope and traveled to a hotel lobby, the place depicted in the photograph. The only information Smith had was the number on the selected envelope. 101097UNX21C. Gray, black, bumpy, pocked. Fresh smells, outdoor smells. Solid, dense, rocky, overhanging, leaning over, um, sense of running water. Why don't we end this site? And uh, Smith's drawings and written descriptions were given to remote viewing expert Edwin May for evaluation. Based on May's standards, he did not consider Smith's session a success, but noted that Smith sensed a variety of shapes and textures found at the hotel lobby. Based on what uh, Mr. Smith drew, I've almost ignored his words, that I got senses of shapes and the thing that comes through very often in remote viewing is what we call repeat motif, where things are happening over and over and over and over again. According to May, had this been a government mission, data such as this would have been reviewed along with other spy gathering information. Often something as simple as a bridge-like structure or a sense of the outdoors would help identify a location. These are some exceptional psychic missions where the remote viewers were able to sense the target and draw almost perfect pictures. They are exceptions. Most drawings are less specific. So what do remote viewing analysts look for? First off, I pay first attention to the drawings. That doesn't mean I, I ignore the words, but the first thing I look at is the drawings. The second thing that I look at is a surprise where the remote viewer is saying, oh, this is hot, this is dry, uh, this seems like, wait a minute, there's a river in the middle of this, what's that doing there, and go back on. So that kind of jerk, that kind of surprise in the, in the transcript is a cue to me saying, I should pay attention to that, and usually that turns out on the average to be right. Analyzing the work of psychic spies is as critical as it is laborious. Even supporters of remote viewing realize it's only one piece of the intelligence gathering puzzle. I look at this as a tool. It's not to be used alone, and no intelligence collecting sensor should be used alone. So it was a tool to help, perhaps in tip off, to alert. I feel that was the strongest case that could be made for applying this phenomenon.
1995, Congress requested an independent investigation into the reliability of using remote viewing for intelligence gathering. Um, I concluded that it definitely has been established as a phenomenon or something similar to what we call remote viewing, but that I couldn't comment on whether or not it's useful for intelligence work because I'm not an intelligence agent. Psychologist Ray Hyman from the University of Oregon also participated in the remote viewing evaluation report, but came to the opposite conclusion. I believe that people can fool themselves very dramatically. In fact, the brighter the person is, in my experience, the, the more clever they can be about fooling themselves and convincing themselves of some, something dramatically uh, obvious is, is not, is really something psychic. I think they made a terrible mistake of trying to bring their case to the scientific community as a whole now because it's so weak that they're going to lose any credibility they have. The remote viewers and the Stanford analysts claim credibility can be found in this highly sensitive log that recorded the unit's activities from 1979 to 1989. It notes that between November 79 and January 1981, remote viewers provided a total of 183 reports to the Joint Chiefs of Staff regarding hostages in Iran. It says that psychics looked for hostage Brigadier General Dozier from December 81 through February 82. During that same time period, another recording confirms the use of psychics in locating terrorist Carlos the Jackal. It also recorded the psychics' failures. The unit tried to locate American soldiers missing from the Vietnam War from July of 81 to September of 82. The log notes those sessions were not helpful thus far. As operations officer for the remote viewing unit, I sat in the position of working with both the tasker who requested the information and the sources who provided the information. So I have a unique viewpoint at knowing what is the value of this remote viewing information because I saw the information flowing both directions. And in many, many cases, we were able to provide very valuable information. Even though not all sessions provided useful information to the intelligence community, the statistics supporting remote viewing are startling. Um, if I had to assess the statistics on the typical kind of remote viewing study that's done, I would say that if you set up a situation where you have a judge comparing a remote viewing session to four possible targets, each of which were equally likely to have been the real target, that you would expect someone to get it right by chance about one-fourth of the time. Instead, they seem to get it right on the order of about a third of the time. So that's the order of magnitude of this. My whole career investigating uh, so-called psychics for the government, going all the way back to 1950s, I have never come across anything when I came in person, I saw I never saw anything alleged to be psychic that looked even remotely puzzling to me. It was usually people usually deluded in their own mind. Based on Hyman and Utz's evaluation of remote viewing and intelligence gathering, Congress scrapped the psychic unit in November of 1995. Soon after, the Army tore down the remote viewers' headquarters at Fort Meade. Jessica Utz questions the value of psychic spies for espionage, but believes the government should have continued its remote viewing research program. I believe that the government made the wrong decision in pulling the rug out from under the research program because I think that what we need to do now is figure out how this works. And it really ought to be funded in the open scientific fields like any other area that we're trying to get a handle on. Um, I think they probably made the right decision when it came to shutting down the intelligence gathering program because this just is not reliable enough yet for us to use it to gather intelligence data that, that's particularly on target. If I were a hostage held somewhere, I would hope the intelligence community would use all tools available to them, and frankly, including remote viewing, which should be properly put into perspective. The final judgment about remote viewing may have to wait until the end of 1998. At that time, according to the CIA, information regarding the psychic unit, now known as the Stargate Collection, will be declassified and made available to the public. Joe McMonagle, Melvin Riley, and Paul Smith 
now all retired from the military, continue to do research on the remote viewing phenomenon. For these three men, psychic spying is a reality. For the rest of us, remote viewing is a mystery that remains unexplained.